present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, the nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. Be still and know that I am God. God invites us to still the nagging uneasiness, those fears of what is and those of the unknown. He says to us, trust me, I will never forsake you. Let us pray. Compassionate God, we come before you today to praise you and thank you for all you have given us. Our family and friends, this community of loving servants, and for Jesus, our brother and friend. Help us, Lord, and calm our fears to look up with hope, not down with despair, and to pray without ceasing, especially when we have doubts. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen.
Good morning, St. Paul's. A reminder for our kids and families at home that there is a new worship and wonder story available on our YouTube page. So you can find the link for that story in the description of this video. As we enter this time set aside for worship, let us covenant with each other to slow down, to set aside those things which distract us, perhaps even more when we are worshiping from home, so that we can be truly open to God's presence. I invite us to begin worship with the belief that we will emerge from the sacred time with our spirits refreshed, renewed, and less burdened than when we started. Let us trust that the Holy Spirit is moving among us, opening new possibilities and planting seeds that will continue to grow in surprising ways. Now let us ground ourselves with a moment of silence as we hold one another in prayer. God of all seasons, in the cold months of winter, after 11 months of life in a pandemic, many of us are feeling weary. The isolation is hard to bear. The limitations are growing old. We miss hugs, new adventures, and time with loved ones. We long for a new season. In the midst of our weariness and anxiety, grant us a new perspective. Help us tap into a spirit of gratitude for the homes that offer us warmth, for technology that keeps us connected even from a distance. We give thanks for organizations like Catholic Parish Outreach, providing food to thousands of local families each month, for Habitat for Humanity, continuing to build homes in Southeast Raleigh. We continue to pray for our teachers and school administrators constantly adapting to new plans and for our hospital workers going above and beyond to provide friendship and comfort to those suffering alone. God, we pray for perseverance for those living with illness, undergoing chemo treatments and battling COVID. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of parents, spouses, and loved ones. Comfort those struggling with seasonal depression and loneliness. May they find hope in the light that grows each day, a reminder of your presence with us. We give thanks that you are a God who listens to our prayers, who cares about our joys and concerns. Holy Spirit, empower us for the week ahead, that we may be people of compassion, justice, and mercy. In your many names we pray. Amen.
As we come to this table, I am reminded of a story from a good friend of mine who was going through a really difficult transition in her life. And she was worried about the impact of this transition, transition on her children. And she told me that in complete surrender, one day she came into the sanctuary and literally envisioned laying her children at the feet of the cross. And in that moment, her children were overshadowed by the power of God and his love. And she knew the relief of knowing that God is in control. As we come to this table today, I invite you to, in your prayer, to visualize literally laying your sins, your shortcomings, and your worries at the foot of the cross and knowing that Christ has paid the ultimate sacrifice in order to carry those to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we bring to this table our shortcomings and our fears, our sins and our failures. We lay these burdens at your feet, surrendering them to you, and here we will find mercy and comfort. For you quietly yet firmly remind us of your sacrifice and triumph, that you paid the ultimate sacrifice and triumphed even over death, carrying our sins and the burdens of loneliness so that we never have to know the absence or the doubt of your love and grace. Let us partake of this bread and wine in reassurance, humility, and joy that there is no sin greater than your grace, nor no burden so heavy that you cannot carry it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Every time we gather around this table, we remember the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. Knowing that he would be betrayed and denied by those with whom he shared this meal, Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Having received the love and grace of God, we are now invited to give from what we have. Many of us share our gifts and time with the St. Paul's community each week, and we are also invited to give financially to support the ministries of the church. If you would like to give, you can send in a check through the mail to our church, or you can give online at stpauls.net. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for your example of humility and generosity. We give thanks for the life of Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not lord his power over others, but rather made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. May we adopt this same attitude as we serve our neighbors and our world, laying down our privilege being quick to open our hands to those in need. We give thanks for the generosity of our community. Bless these gifts given today, that they may sow seeds of justice, healing, and salvation in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
share his gift of music with my St. Paul's family this morning. We continue our look at the Sermon on the Mount today with Jesus's words from Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. 
Each day has enough trouble of its own. William Kamkwamba was hungry. In 2001, a drought caused famine in his village in Malawi. All the fields dried up. At night, his large family shared their one meal of the day, a bowl of cornmeal porridge. Each person got three bites. Around them, people were starving to death. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? These words of Jesus seem absurd, even cruel, in a situation like this. But William did not worry. Well, he may have been worried, but he was not immobilized by his worry. This boy, just 14 years old at the time, this boy who had to drop out of school because of hunger and poverty, was determined to do something, to create a different future. He couldn't afford to go to school, and there were no crops to farm in the field, so he spent his time in a small library, resolved to continue his education. Many of the books were in English, which he didn't know very well, but he used the pictures and the diagrams in science books to teach himself the words. In one of these books, he found instructions for how to make a windmill, which could pump water and generate electricity. William knew this could make a huge difference for his family and his community. But he had no money and no supplies. He didn't worry. He went to the junkyard and scrounged together some parts. An old bicycle frame, a tractor fan, some scraps of PVC pipe. His own mother thought he was crazy. But William didn't worry. First, he built a windmill that powered an electric light and then kept working on it until it had a whole circuit breaker that powered multiple lights. People from his village lined up to charge their cell phones. His second windmill pumped water to irrigate the fields. A boy without a high school education who had never left his community or used a computer brought electricity and irrigation to his village in a time of need. When his family had nothing to eat, he didn't let worry trap him in despair. William was focused on something bigger, something that could change not only his life, it could change his community. His story was told in a book and a movie called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Most of us don't have to worry about where our next meal is coming from. But that doesn't mean that we don't have real worries of our own. That doesn't make it any easier for us to follow Jesus' teaching. Do not worry about tomorrow. And right now, this teaching may feel harder than ever. Our health and the health of our loved ones our economy, our children's education, the integrity of our political system, the future of our planet, all feel like real causes for worry. We can at least agree with Jesus' words that each day has enough troubles of its own. But Jesus is not asking us something absurd or impossible. Regardless of how much or how little we have, regardless of what exactly fuels our own anxieties about tomorrow, Jesus is teaching us all how to bring about the kingdom of heaven, in which we have no more worries. The same theme that runs through the whole Sermon on the Mount lies behind this text, too. We're given a vision 
for what it looks like when we create the kind of community that God envisions for us. A world in which all are fed, in which peace and mercy, righteousness and justice prevail. Rather than giving us an impossible standard to follow, Jesus is giving us instructions on exactly how we can do what might seem out of our reach. We only have to learn how to decipher the blueprint in front of us and trust that we can do what others might think is crazy. When our goal becomes making sure that everyone has enough, then no individual among us has to worry about where their next meal will come from or whether they will have a coat on a cold day. When we seek the kingdom of God and God's righteousness first, above all other goals, then we don't have to spend our energy worrying about our personal well-being. Then we are all taking care of each other. We are harnessing the collective energy of God's people to generate a new way of life together. Later in Matthew 25, Jesus tells his disciples that every time they have fed someone who is hungry or shared clothes with someone in need, They have not only cared for God, they have come closer to experiencing God's kingdom. He says, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Of course, this is not how the world works yet. Many in our world still have to put all of their energy into meeting the basic daily needs of their family to survive. Many people, even in our own community, work more than one job and still struggle to pay food and rent. Just imagine if the energy, resourcefulness, and creativity that so many of our neighbors put into just getting by could instead be turned into transforming our communities into thriving centers of God's justice and peace. Worry, at its root, grows out of feeling helpless. When we fear that the future is beyond our ability to control, when we can't see how to bring about the outcome that we dream of. My worries are always strongest in the middle of the night when I'm lying in bed thinking about all the tasks or problems in the darkness And there's nothing I can do but lie there and think about everything that could go wrong. But as soon as I get up the next day and begin to work on a solution, even hard problems start to feel more manageable. And my anxiety fades. This passage that we read today has often been used as as an excuse to be passive in the face of our challenges, to suggest that Don't worry means just leave all the hard work to God, and God will make sure everything works out in the end. If we are just faithful enough, if we can just stop ourselves from worrying, then God will bless us with all of our basic needs. In this view, hunger and poverty are signs that we just don't trust God enough. But Jesus never promises that following God brings wealth and comfort, or that God will do all the heavy lifting for us. In fact, Jesus tells his disciples the exact opposite over and over again, warning them about how hard it is to share in his ministry, how much they will have to give up. Jesus calls us not to passivity, but to action. Claiming the agency that we have, no matter our circumstances, is the best way to reduce our worry. What Jesus calls us to do to alleviate our worry is to dream bigger, to be concerned not just about our basic daily needs, not just our own family's health and security, but about how the whole world can thrive. It may sound counterintuitive, but thinking bigger about our problems together actually helps us to worry less. 
if we're all doing our best to make God's vision a reality, if we are all taking action to bring about God's kingdom, then surely we will start to see it all around us. If we read Matthew closely, Jesus never actually tells us not to worry at all. He doesn't say, don't worry, period. But he tells us which things not to worry about. About what we'll eat, what we'll wear, about tomorrow's unknown troubles. Instead, he urges us to focus our attention today on seeking God's kingdom in this moment. It's unrealistic to think that we can totally eradicate worry from our minds when we are facing truly daunting challenges. Jesus tells us not to be trapped or immobilized by our worry. When we are anxious about what the future might hold, to let that feeling spur us to imagine instead the future that we want to see not just for ourselves, but for all of creation. And then to join God in bringing that hoped-for outcome into being. Mystic poet Rumi said, What you seek is seeking you. Are we pursuing the kind of community in which God's ways prevail? Or are we seeking a world in which everyone desperately meets their own needs at the expense of others? Whichever one we are striving for, we are likely to find. What you seek is seeking you. Let us seek first God's kingdom and righteousness. As we close today, we're invited to put these words of Jesus to work in the days ahead. And several opportunities to do that. We have our green team that is going to meet by Zoom this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. So anyone is welcome to join their meeting. They're going to do some um, planning about upcoming events like Earth Sunday and hear more from um, about our Uh, solar panel possibilities. So the link for that will be in the midweek email. That's this Wednesday at 7. And believe it or not, Lent is coming up soon. Not this week, but the week after. We begin with Ash Wednesday on February 17th. Um, So we'll be sharing more details in the midweek email, but want to be sure you know that you're invited to celebrate Ash Wednesday with a virtual worship service we're going to do jointly with Community United Church of Christ. That'll be on February 17th at 6.30 p.m. The first half an hour is a time of discussion and and fellowship. And then at 7 that evening, our virtual worship service will be a a service of reflection and blessing. Um, And then another opportunity on Ash Wednesday is to come to the church parking lot, do a drive-through blessing and service of ashes. So you can come anytime that day between 8 and 9 a.m., or 11.30 and 12.30 in the middle of the day, and just roll down your window. We'll give you the materials you need to put the ashes on your own forehead and give you a blessing through your car window. 
Um, you'll also have a chance then to pick up a packet of Lenten materials for, um, to worship at home throughout Lent with a devotional and some other resources. If you can't come at that time, you can pick up that Lenten packet um, that whole week of Ash Wednesday and take it home with you um, and hope you will take advantage of that and use that devotional. If you need us to mail you or to deliver to you that packet, just let Amanda or I know and we're happy to get that to you. We also want to encourage you um, to consider getting an additional optional Lenten devotional called uh, Lent of Liberation by Sherry Mills. That will be our adult Bible studies guide during Lent. And it's also a great resource and devotion. Um, even if you can't take part in the Bible study, we encourage you to order that for your own um, spiritual meditations during Lent. And now, if you will join me in the benediction as we close our worship. Please read the words in bold printed on your screen. You are the salt of the earth. Go and savor the goodness of God. You are the light of the world. Go and let your light shine. You are the children of God. Go and proclaim God's kingdom in word and action. Amen.